You know, I am so excited to talk to you, Dr. Lisa. And, you know, something that I heard you say, I want to jump right into it because something I heard you say really stopped me in my tracks. And you said that women are really good at story keeping as opposed to story telling. And I, I would love for you to share what do you mean by story keeping? Well, thank you so much. It's a really good question. And I love talking about this. Uh, it was one of the major findings in some of my doctoral research that women are shy or hesitant to talk about some of the challenges that they experience. And it's because of the expectations on us to be perfect. So we're supposed to, I don't know if you know that commercial from the, from the 70s, and I'm probably dating myself, I'm a Gen Xer, but you know that you can, you can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan and never, never let you forget you're a man. Okay, uh, that idea that we can be the chief cook, bottle washer, earn an incredible living, raise the kids and do it all in heels. Oh, and size four, right? That we can do all of that. And not only that we can do all of that, but that we should do all of that. So there's a sort of social expectations that, that we should do it all. And then when you're raised in that environment of, well, this is what you should be doing, you take it in, right? And it becomes part of you. And so we stop admitting when we're imperfect. We don't talk about where we're struggling so much. And this is particularly true when we get to perimenopause and menopause. So when women start to get to be about 35 and 40 years old, bodies start to change, right? We're, we're not, um, we may be ovulating regularly, but it's not quite the same. The, the cycles changed a little bit, bodies changing, you go to bed one night, you know, uh, and then you wake up in the morning and your jeans don't fit. They fit you yesterday, they don't fit you today. Or you, you don't fall asleep or you fall asleep and you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep. So everything is changing so much. And, you know, our mothers never talked about menopause, never talked about what was happening to their bodies. They just silently suffered, right? And another really good example of this is when uh, women become pregnant and you know they they we are all yay congratulations i'm so happy for you and we never say oh say goodbye to your sleep say goodbye to you know feeling good about yourself say goodbye to your memory because you're going to be so freaking exhausted you're not going to remember anything let's not talk about the delivery because if we talk about the delivery you are not going to want to go through with this pregnancy like we're guilty of it from from almost you know almost puberty we don't tell young girls what it's like to get your first menstrual period what kind of discomfort you could be experiencing it's all oh yeah you're a woman now <laughs> i you know and that just it just hits so hard and i think you know i think part of that is very much, you know, we weren't like, I, my, I have to say that my mother, my baby boomer mother did sort of raise me a little bit in, you know, in response to her own very traditional, very Catholic, you know, upbringing. And so she did share a little bit with me, but I think it's not enough. I think we are not in this culture of like really transparent sharing. And I, I, I absolutely agree this idea that, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to show the crack, you know, in our armor, right. we don't want to admit that like attempting to have it all actually sometimes breaks you down. But I think the other thing, particularly for you know, a gender that is, is really traditionally cultured to be caretakers. Um, this idea that if we don't share, we're actually contributing to women feeling like no one else is going through this. It must be just me. There must be something wrong yes. with me. Yes. Exactly. So then, so then it sort of seals up the, the vault a little bit tighter, right? Well, I can't admit it. And 
and then that perpetuates that imperfection and I'm not good enough and all of that kind of thing. And so as, as we started this idea of starts at puberty, gets to pregnancy and childbirth and you know being a young mom and all of that, and then we get to perimenopause and menopause. And it's sort of like the last frontier of taboo land. We we're starting to crack it open now, but all of the experiences of women going through perimenopause, menopause, and all the physical and social changes that come along with that experience um, there, there, there hasn't been that big conversation. And this idea in other cultures that respects the crone, that respects the elder, we don't have that in, in Canada. We don't have it in the United States, right? The Western world doesn't really embrace aging, doesn't embrace wisdom that comes from aging. And I, I call myself a crone in training. I'm not a crone yet <laughs> because technically, you know, the, the crone stage is sort of your, your, your last phase. I'm not there, but I'm definitely a crone in training. And I'm standing on this threshold of having a little bit of wisdom that comes from a life experience, right? But then also realizing, oh, I have to pivot and share because if I just keep it to myself, then I'm story keeping, right? And, and not helping to change the culture and, and the conversation for women particularly. So um, it's really powerful or empowering, I think, to be able to share this information for women. Well, and just to normalize everything too, I think exactly what you said, I love that idea of the archetype, like the archetype of the mother, the archetype of the crone and that transition in, in between. And, and I agree in our culture, we don't we don't value aging. And so I think, you know, another thing that really underlies that story keeping is that idea that if we admit, you know, particularly over the age of 40, like if we admit to these experiences, if we admit to these changes, we're admitting to aging, we're admitting to not being like young anymore. And I think there's a bit of a fear of being written off. Like certainly, certainly I remember, so like I'm turning 43 this year and you know, I feel young, like in so many ways, I mean, in so many ways, I also feel exhausted, but yeah. like in so many ways, I honestly don't feel that different from my 30 year old self. Right. right. And, but I know my 25 year old self looking at someone who is 40 and being like, Psh, you know, <laughs> like, yes, what do you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, what do you know? Like, you're just not even in it anymore. And I, and being here now, like having the privilege of being here now at yeah. 42, I'm like, Oh no, no, I do know. Like I've gotten better. Like this, yes. this isn't about turning a page and not mattering anymore. Like I have gotten better and what a gift and what a privilege and, you know, being able to sort of like normalize and, and be really, really vocal about what life is at this stage, I think can only be an empowering for us and an important reclamation for us, but but also for young women, because so what are you going to do? Like not live, like not live like the right. last half of your life. Like what is there to look forward to otherwise? Right. And, and there is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of exterior pressure. Um, a lot of things, you know, women go through this sense of suddenly feeling invisible, right? Um, you're probably not quite there yet, but it does happen. FYI, I think it's about pheromones, but nobody's done the study. Anyway, <laughs> I have this sense, you know, um, uh, uh, you walk into a room and nobody notices you anymore. You speak and nobody hears you anymore. And it can you sort of reinforce that story keeping because you think, well, I don't matter. I'm not here. Nobody sees me. I'm just going to keep my wisdom, my thoughts, my being to myself. When really, you know, that's the time where we have an opportunity to change the trajectory of um, it, the experience of women in midlife and beyond. And it does take courage. It takes cojones. It takes ovaries to be able to um, to say, "I know you're. You don't want to hear me. You don't want to see me. But here we go." And and it is a big deal, um, and very very important that we do that. So, uh, and, and I firmly believe that when women get, you know, into their forties and and fifties and sixties and um, starting to realize that those expectations that other people have of us and that we took on without really questioning, when we get to the place where we're starting to question them and we're starting to get better with our own boundaries and we're starting to value our, our own selves, I think when women are at that place, we become incredibly powerful and we scare men. 
we scare men because we no longer play the game, right? And I love men. I'm not, I'm not bashing men. I'm the mother of a son, love him dearly. I'm just saying that in our culture that sort of run on how men think and how men do things, when a woman who's sure of herself comes into that structure, um, it's rattling, particularly for the, women, the men who can go, oh, that's a really good point right oh that's that's a shift that needs to happen and it can be it can be uh, rattling but i really think to, to sort of wrap up this idea when women stand in their power and they own who they are we can change the world we can fix what's happening out in the world but we really do have to own it and if that starts with with um, storytelling instead of story keeping then let's move forward with that yeah I love that. I do. I, I a hundred percent agree. Like I am married to an incredible man, but this world is created for cis white men. And there's a lot of, you know, there was a lot of injustice and lack of equity and downright, you know, sort of gatekeeping of power and voice that needs to go beyond also cis white women and you know extend throughout but i agree it is is that speaking our truth and claiming the power that is inherently ours um which is creating and will create a seismic shift in how this planet operates and i for one cannot wait but i yeah. so this is oh my gosh i love this conversation so much so let's talk because this is your phd work so let's talk a little bit about your background because you and i have known of each other through the natural health world so how did you get your start and how did you end up here it, it, yeah it's interesting isn't it uh so when my son was born i discovered that he had um a congenital heart defect. So he has um, a bicuspid aortic valve. And all that means is where most people have three flaps to close their heart, he has two. So his closes like this and it causes a heart murmur. So as a, as a mom, um, I thought, well, uh, he, he could live forever and never have a problem. He could need heart valve replacement at 20. Um, I like plan A right? He could live forever and never have a problem. Not forever. He could live a long life and never have a problem. But he's not going to get that way unless I step in and make sure that he makes good, healthy choices. So that was the impetus for me to study nutrition. And I became a registered holistic nutritionist with the goal to teach. I thought what I learn, I will then turn around and teach because we don't get any kind of nutrition training in school. And what we do get is questionable sometimes because A, it's, it's so far behind the research and so far behind what we know to be true. And there's also, as we've come to see in, in the current culture, a lot of marketing influence, different boards stepping in saying, well, we need to have this and we need to have that. And I think it skews what is true about nutrition. So, uh, so I started doing that and I became an educator, a writer. I would do um, television and radio interviews. I ended up starting my own radio show. I had a call-in radio show live. That was lots of fun here in uh, St. Catharines. I live in Niagara, Ontario. And, and, and then I dabbled in taking on clients as well. And so I would work with women primarily. And you know we would create a strategy for working together. So let, for a simple example, we would agree that she would drink more water that week, right? And so, um, yes, yes, I can do that. I can see the value in doing that. So then we would get together in the next week and I would say, so how did you do with drinking more water? And she'd say, ooh, well, I didn't, I didn't do it. This came up and that came up and I had a problem with this and I had a problem with that. And I said, no worries, no worries. Let's, can we do it again this week? Can we try this week? Long story short, weeks would go by without her drinking more water. And it wasn't just this woman, it was the next woman and the next woman and the next woman. And, and so no matter what the women were saying, yes, I wanna do this, this is really important to me. I wanna be healthy, I wanna have energy, I wanna sleep at night, I wanna stop biting my husband's head off. Whatever it was, they, they, something got in the way of them making the changes. So um, I got frustrated as a practitioner thinking I'm not helping anybody. And the reason I'm not helping anybody is because I don't understand what the problem is. 
you say you want to do it, do it. Something is getting in the middle. So I went back to school and got my master's degree. And I studied what women, midlife of women experience in eating. So what is it like for them to eat? So it's a very general question, but I wanted to understand how they made choices about what they ate, when they ate, how they ate, who they ate with, that kind of thing. So that was my master's degree. And then the academic bug bit a little bit. And I thought, well, it's not just about eating. There's other stuff going on too. And some of that came up um, in the master's work. And what's really interesting, I'll share about the master's work because I'm sure some of your listeners have experienced this. Women at midlife make food choices based on how foods make them feel. So I learned that women, for example, would, um, you know, stop eating chocolate if they found it made them tired. Or they would um, check their calendar to see what was on the schedule the next day before they had another glass of wine because they knew they wouldn't sleep well and then they'd be exhausted the next day. So, so many of the choices that they made um, were based on what they, what, what they wanted to feel like based on what was on the calendar and how, you know, how, what was expected of them. So anyway, uh, then I decided in my doctoral research to explore uh, how women experience self-care and what gets in the way of women actually taking care of themselves when they set these expectations of the things that they would like to achieve what gets in the way. So story keeping came up from that, that, that idea of, uh, well, I didn't know, and I, and I don't want to um, upset or thwart another woman, so I'm not going to share this stuff. That's difficult, right? Okay, I think you're, you are absolutely blowing my mind here. And I, one of the things that you said about your master's work, I find absolutely fascinating and potentially a really powerful tool in directing your nutrition because I think often in our 20s, because we still have are inundated with this terrible diet culture that tells us that a single type of body is ideal. And many of our food choices and activity choices are directed at that goal. And for myself personally, uh, in my 30s, you know, I found myself not with nutrition, because nutrition is like, you know, I live and breathe food and nutrition, but particularly with my exercise. I found myself really hating exercise because I only connected exercise to an external goal, either because I thought I needed to do something impressive, like run a half marathon, and therefore I needed to run to run a half marathon. Right. or I needed to exercise to adjust my size. Right. And in my 30s, one of the most powerful changes that I made in my late, unfortunately, it took me a long time, but like in my mid and late 30s, as I started connecting exercise to how it made me feel. Mm. And I fell back in love with exercise again, because it's like, if I'm having a garbage day, I can go for a quick jog. And it's like it washes off of me. And then I was hooked because yeah. I was like, this is such a powerful tool to make me feel good. I don't care about my size. I do not care about achieving anything. Like I am moving simply for the good feeling. And then I was like, oh, I love this. Like now I'm into this. Yes. So that's, that sort of explains the, a concept in um, academia called body function. So everybody's quite familiar with body image. Body image is how you perceive that you look, right? In terms of, um, are you wearing the right size jeans? Are you tall enough? Are, you know, are your boobs big enough or small enough or whatever it is that you find attractive? For men, are you tall enough? Do you have large pecs? Whatever, it, it's what you look like. Well, body function is how you feel in your body. And do you like your body? And can you, you know, how many, how many, you know, kilometers can you walk or jog? And what do you feel like when you're done? And how do you sleep? And when we can shift our focus from body image, how we look to body function, how we feel, it does make all of those things a lot easier. So, so your example is perfect. It's a perfect example of body function. Okay. I want to shift to a, like a less favorable <laughs> side of body function, you know, because we've alluded to, you know, the changes that happen after 40, a couple of times. And, you know, one of the reasons um, that I was really excited to pick your brain uh, on this episode was that 
I noticed that after 40, and it's also a challenge, just the way that like my 30s were completely connected to being a mother because I had my child, my first child when I turned 30, my 40s are connected to the pandemic because I turned 40 and six months later we were locked down. And so there's a lot that I have noticed really changing in my mental well-being and my mental function. So um, a great example is that my mood is far more dysregulated and absolutely I recognize like we know that there's a pandemic piece of that, but I find that it's more difficult to regulate my mood, um, making those runs all the more important. I also find that my, my memory and my cognitive function just don't feel like they used to. And for me, that's, it actually attacks my sense of self a little bit because yeah. I always really prided myself on being so sharp, so quick, like a yeah. near photographic memory, like, like, what do we, what do we know about the brain right now? And like, is there hope for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is absolutely hope for you. And I have to say how many pieces of paper I have scattered around me so that I remember all of the touch points that I want to get to today when we talk. And, and so to, to not talk about um, uh, the physical for a moment, again, well, let's go back to the social. There's a lot of pressure um, you know, what, what's happened in the last two years, notwithstanding, there's a lot of pressure. Get the kids where they're supposed to be, get them to school on time. Did they get their homework done? Does, does your partner, you know, need X, Y, Z from you? How are your parents doing? Cause we're getting into that stage of our lives, right? When our parents are starting to need us, then we have any kind of other responsibilities. Do you volunteering? Do you have a, you know, do you go to church? Do you know, there's all of this stuff and there's only so much room in here. And I remember when I was going through, you know, perimenopause, my daughter admitted to me later, she was concerned about me because I would forget. Like, and, and I was like, okay, here's the deal, honey. My brain is a bucket. I've been living a long time now, decades. There's a lot of stuff in that bucket. If what you tell me isn't important or you don't get my attention first, like mom, I'm talking to you, pay attention. Whatever you say is probably going to flow right out of that bucket. So permission, everybody, to give yourself some slack. There's a lot, you know, competing for your attention and your bucket is only so full. Now, having said that, you know, a lot of people think that as you get older, your brain shrinks. Not true. I mean, yes, there's, there's, there's changes. However, you can continue to learn. You can continue and you should. You should continue to try and learn new activities, even doing simple things like trying to brush your teeth with the wrong hand right? Driving home a different way. Every time you stimulate your brain to do something new or think something uh, differently, you know, you, you stimulate new neural pathways in your brain and your brain gets, gets much more healthy. So, um, so that's important to understand too. We got this, you only have the bucket. There's only so much room, you know, get my attention. <laughs> List making is wonderful. Um, but, but the other part is there are some changes that happen to our bodies and to our brains as we get older. So uh, we just need to be aware of that. And interestingly, as women are, are starting to think, gee, I, I used to remember everything. I used to, you know, quick with the comebacks and I, you know, photographic memory, as you said. This is happening at the same time that all your body is changing. Like, you know, body composition is changing because you're not producing as much estrogen anymore or you get shots of estrogen. And then everybody's under so much stress now, right? That our cortisol is through the roof. Well, cortisol isn't, it doesn't get along with memory, right? If you've got high cortisol, you've got low memory, right? So there's all of these things that we need to really give ourselves some slack, right? Forgive ourselves. <laughs> For forgetting some little things but there's a lot that we can do to help too and that's what i would really like to talk about is this this idea of there's some simple self-care that you can put into place when mood and memory and focus is an issue and let's confess it's an issue you know you you want to remember <laughs> You, you are literally like seeing into my soul and describing my life right now my kids say you know Oh, mom, we know you you don't remember things. So it's okay. I'm going to tell you again, <laughs> like it is, it's famous in my family. And it's, and it's one of the, it's one of the reasons why I'm very obsessed with lion's mane. 
So like anyone who's part of this community knows that I talk about mushrooms all the time and I'm very, very in love with lion's mane and I take it to support my brain. Like, can you, like, let's, let's talk a little bit about mushrooms. Let's shift here because okay. like, why, why lion's mane? Like, why would someone like me take lion's mane to support my brain? Okay. So this is, this is going to seem a little bit like a detour, but it's not. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk about your gut for a second. Okay. Now everybody thinks when you think of your brain, you think of the central nervous system, you know, the brain, the spinal cord sends out information. Well, we have a second brain called the enteric nervous system and it's in the gut. And in the gut, that's where we make about, um, you know, 95% of the serotonin, which is the feel good hormone, which is in the pineal gland, transformed into melatonin that helps you sleep, which by the way, helps you consolidate memory, right? So uh, we have that, and this is a little off topic, but so much of your immune system is in your gut, right? So if we can keep the gut healthy, then we're actually going to improve um, our, our memory and focus because 90% of the conversation between our brain and our gut actually starts in the gut. You think about that for a second. So, um, you know, at this time in our lives when we're so busy, we're maybe not eating properly or eating on the run, eating standing up, eating in the car. We forget to drink water. You know, we're not getting enough fiber in our diet. Well, if we're not getting enough fiber in the diet, then we're not feeding the bacteria that keep us healthy, help to digest our food, and that manufacture a whole bunch of serotonin and other good chemicals for our bodies as well. So we want to make sure that the gut is healthy. We want to make sure that we're providing um, both probiotics, which is the live bacteria, but also prebiotics, which are the fibers, those foods that feed the probiotics. Okay, so in some ways, mushrooms help with brain body function because they're a source of prebiotic fibers. They're broken down into short chain fatty acids in the gut which feed the um, prebiotics and can, can manipulate how your body functions. So that's really critical. Now we move, so we've got a healthy gut, right? Yep. We move into the brain. There's a bunch of things that you can do to support the brain. One of them we've already, we've already talked about. Don't feed it so much, right? Don't make it remember so much. Write down lists, get people to pay, you know, make eye contact when they're talking to you. Uh, stop, stop worrying about things that don't matter. Stop worrying about things you can't change. You know, get off the internet, right? I mean, so much research shows two minutes on the internet, your mood, right? Just, just don't do that. So in some ways we want to starve the brain, stop giving it the garbage. And then we want to feed the brain. We want to give it the stuff that's going to make it healthy. So, you know, your brain is made of fat. You want to make sure you're getting healthy fats in there. Your brain needs a whole bunch of different vitamins to function. Make sure your brain is getting that. Lion's mane is amazing for the brain for a whole bunch of reasons. For one, it helps to um, create um, nerve growth factor. And it also helps with brain derived nootropin factor. So without getting too sciencey, these are things that your brain needs in order to build nerves, protect nerves, create those neural pathways when you want to learn something and want to remember. But we also see that lion's mane can help to take out the garbage. So we're not adding extra garbage, we're giving the brain what it needs, but then lion's mane also helps the glymphatic system, which is the janitor system. So it goes in and helps to clean out the debris that can uh, lead to plaques that are associated with dementia and Alzheimer's. So, um, so those are the sort of the short and long-term benefits of incorporating lion's mane, but then, then there's the everyday, helps with focus, helps with concentration, uh, helps, promotes healthy mood, right? So, um, and, and of course, a source, source of these uh, short-term, sorry, short chain fatty acids that help to keep the gut healthy. So it's a win, 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 I think. That's amazing. So, okay. There is so much we need to unpack there. And I want to start, well, A, I'm glad, I'm glad on the lion's mane. I'm glad that my devotion for lion's mane is well-placed Yes. Uh, because I'm literally obsessed with it. Um, but also you mentioned computers. 
and screens and you know i will i will misquote everything that i've read because of course you know brain and this was right. not something that i had i had like planned a stat for but i read somewhere that like our brains now like over the course of a single day like we get exposed to more data and information than like people in like 1900 like saw in a whole year or something like yes we're actually expecting so much processing power from our brain and particularly around mood because i see this in my practice too because of course we do you know gut brain is our life you know we do digestive health and often folks with irritable bowel syndrome have increased depression or anxiety um, and it usually goes hand in hand in so many of our clients and one of the things that i'll note particularly with younger clients i'm like how often are you on your phone and people don't think about it i was like go into your screen time right go into your phone and you tell me and it's our i mean i know for me because i live my life doing these things but it's ours and i was like every time you pick up that phone you're looking for that dopamine hit you're also scrambling like you are you are making yourself more on edge more anxious and people yeah. are astounded because we're so we're so online now we're so connected now that disconnecting feels foreign and i and I wonder how much of that is compounding what's happening to us in our 40s and 50s, because now, in addition to everything that we're dealing with, we're also putting this screen in front of our face for hours a day. Right. That's telling us stuff we don't need to know. Right. Like, you know, we, we find out that there was a car accident in China. Like, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, anything about that. And, like, who's dating who and who said what and, like, all of these you know, all of this stuff that is, it literally does feel like it's polluting, like a our processing. Percent. And when you, when you go back to how we started this conversation and, and those social pressures and the social expectations, are we now supposed to care about, you know, Hollywood stars suing each other? Are we supposed to actually care? Are we supposed to care um, what, you know, two people wore the same dress? Oh my gosh, you know, so, so we get these messages that we're supposed to care about this stuff. And, and then we feel badly when we're not up on it, right? People get surprised when I tell them I don't have email on my phone. I Evolutionary. Use, I know I'm a rebel. I use my phone as a phone. You and Cal Newport, you're doing the deep work here. Like that's, <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. So I got a cell phone when my kids started to be mobile. Right. And, and now I need it for work, but I only use it as a phone. And frankly, I prefer it when people text me. Right. Cause then I can get to it when I get to it. Um, but I have no apps on my phone other than what is required to run the system. And it's amazing to me. I can go away for the weekend and forget my phone and not realize I don't have my phone until I'm coming home. You know, I get home and see, you know, 20 people texted and wondered where I was, right? Well, those are 20 texts that didn't need to be answered either. So um, it's interesting, this addiction that we have, as you mentioned, the dopamine hits. And I think it's a really great first step to just delete one app and then make peace with it and delete another app and just keep going. Like, there's no reason you need your banking on your phone. Now, now, if your phone is your whole computer system, that's a different story. But when, when it's a secondary device, which I think it is for most people, you, you don't need it. So can we talk a little bit because, so one of the things that I have to say, I've always meant to do and I've never done, um, but just in the last few days, because I do sort of wake up, I have two kids, they gotta get out to school and like adjust, you're so on, right? Like, as opposed to that beautiful, like influencer morning ritual of rising with the sunlight and, you know, taking two hours for yoga and journaling all it, no, like I'm on. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I am trying to do just this week is not look at my phone until 8 30 when my kids leave for school because i'm like there's 
there's nothing I can do. There is no way I need to know before 8.30. Right. And it is kind of transformational. Nice. So that makes me curious with all of this, what, like, are there some practices? Uh, are there some, like, doable, reasonable, realistic rituals that we can sort of incorporate into our life to like support our mental well-being and our physical well-being. Well, I love that you said ritual because I think that in itself is a solution. So when you have a thousand things vying for your attention and you uh, are, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you go to bed at night and your brain clicks on and you have to solve all the world's problems. Every night. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> or you, you know there's a big event coming up and your brain gets creative at 11 o'clock, right? Oh, remember, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got, oh, call him, call her, make sure you meet with that person. Did you order that thing? Um, you know, when you've got all of those kinds of thoughts, uh, by the way, the answer to that is having a pad beside your bed and write everything down. And no, note, I didn't say have your phone right beside your bed because, um This might get a little bit of pushback, but your phone doesn't emit EMS, electromagnetic frequencies that can keep your brain active. Um, There is research that shows that we are impacted by that. I mean, we are electrical beings, right? Information passes through our body um, as in electrical impulses. It makes sense that we are impacted by electrical frequencies. So get the phone away from you, six feet away from you, um, and write down your thoughts on paper. And it's amazing how cleansing that is. Oh, I've already worried about that. I don't have to worry about that anymore, right? Um, So that's really good. But the rituals really help when you can develop a a routine. You don't have to think about what you're doing. You don't have to remember. You don't have to suddenly have a panic attack that you didn't do this or didn't do that. So health rituals are critical. And I think that it's really important um, to incorporate things like our supplements into a ritual. And I think morning rituals are great. I, I get this question all the time from people, when should I take my supplements? When you remember. The best time to take them is when you take them, right? They're not helping anybody if they're in the cupboard. So if you have uh, supplements that you you know that you need to take, and there are some that I'm sure that you have talked to your listeners about, they should be taking every day. I won't step on toes telling you what mine are. But instead of trying to remember them, have all of your supplements that you like to take in a basket, in a bowl, something attractive, and leave it right there on the counter. Because that way, uh, it's not going to be in the cupboard where you're going to forget. You know, it's 8.35, you're rushing out the door. You get halfway down the street and realize, oh, no, I didn't do it, right? So that ritual of first thing in the morning, having your supplements, uh, I think is really critical to success. Again, you're not, you're not thinking about it. You're not trying to remember, and it's done first thing. So something like lion's mane, right? If you have, when we know that that's good for focus and concentration and memory, when you have that first thing in the morning, you are setting yourself up for a day when you can remember and focus and concentrate and feel good. Um, And the best thing about that is lion's mane is a mushroom. It's a food. You can take it on an empty stomach and it's not going to cause any complications for you. So um, I think that that's um, a brilliant addition to a health ritual. Mm. Um, I love that. So this idea, and I love that your, your idea of ritual is so simple. Because like I said, I think we got inundated over like the last decade with these absolutely ridiculous things that like anyone with a real life can't do. And I I love this idea of, and something I talk about with, you know, my community a lot is building really soft, flexible structures and making making it easy to be healthier. And one of the rituals that I recommend is the first thing that you do in the morning after you brush your teeth and go to the washroom is drink water. Yes. And so it's actually perfect if you, if you have your supplements there too. So you're like drinking your water and, and like taking your supplements, because I find that, you know, so many of us don't drink enough water. The first thing that I do, if I don't drink water is the first thing I do is I go and hit the button on the coffee machine. And you're like, but you're missing this opportunity to like hydrate, 
so much of the fatigue you think you feel may be dehydration. And so you have like a third or fourth coffee when really maybe only one is necessary if you drank that water in the morning. Or um, the one thing that I'm much better at doing uh, before this week was just putting my phone away at night. So my phone would ideally be away after 8 p.m. It goes nowhere near the bedroom, but I would allow myself to decompress. So I love that idea of simplicity because if we've already got so much going on, like it needs to not be a burden to take care of ourselves. Well, a hundred percent. And, and also don't d- jump into the deep end of the pool. Oh, I have to change my entire life. I'm falling apart. I have to change everything. No, drink more water, drink more water. And, you know, to, to change that ritual a little bit, fill up a, a container of water and you have to drink that today. Right. And then, yes, your supplements are right there. Beside the water pitcher that you're going to drink today, there are your supplements. Have them first thing in the morning, right? So, yeah, it's really simple. And then do that for a couple of weeks until you're not thinking about it anymore. And then you add that, well, I'm going to go for a walk around the block, right? So it it doesn't have to be jumping into the deep end and then drowning or saying, no, it's too cold. It's it's too deep. I'm I'm not doing any of it. Right. Well, it exactly. And it, and it speaks back again to this notion that we put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect, which is ludicrous and that it has to be, yeah, I'm not just going to do a little bit better. I'm going to be like amazing today. The and then it falls apart because it's unsustainable. And now you mentioned, oh, I don't want to tell you the supplements I'm taking. Everybody wants to hear the <laughs> supplements that you're taking. So if you don't mind, if it's not too personal, like what does Dr. Lisa Petty take to feel great? Well, I I actually wrote a book. Of, oh gosh, I don't know. If, I can't even do the math. A while ago, I wrote a book, and I talked about essentials that I think everybody should take every day. So I think that everybody should take omega threes every day because they are so hard to get in the diet. I think that everybody should take probiotics, or at least prebiotics. Um, you know, people have different conditions now where maybe probiotics aren't a good idea, but we want to feed that good bacteria. Uh, we need protein. So most of us under consume protein. So we need, you know, what, what's great too, is if you do a morning smoothie, there's another ritual for you. Throw in your scoop of protein powder, throw in your omega-3s, throw in what are your prebiotics, your probiotics, throw in your lion's mane or your reishi or whatever it is that you're going to have in the morning um, and, and, you know, have it all at once. So yes, it, uh, protein, um, omega-3 fats, prebiotics, probiotics, and and I also love lion's mane. So, uh, and, and for all of the reasons, not just I want to get through today, but that concept of being the janitor and keeping my brain clean, I think that's really critical. Um, and just you know, a little bit more free information about that. Uh, we need to be sleeping well in order for our brains to clean. So uh, it, it, your brain doesn't clean up while you're awake. You need to be unconscious. So do what you can to support your sleep as well. Um, what you said just mimicked, I just, I had never, because the, the, the central nervous system is not a huge focus for me in my work. So I had just heard of the glymphat. People have heard of the lymphatic system, but yes. the glymphatic system. I just heard that last week at a conference from the doctors, Shurzai, the neuroscientists and, and, uh, and brain health docs. And when they, they had also said exactly what you did, like we need to sleep. And when I think about the first decade of me being a parent, I went from getting eight hours of sleep every single night, no problem, waking up without an alarm, no problem, to being exhausted. And it wasn't until I found, and like everyone in my community is sick of hearing me say this, but it changed my life. So I'm going to say it again. I, I take magnesium glycinate, 400 milligrams, and 200 milligrams of L-theanine every single night to help me sleep. Yes. And it changed my life. Like... I don't know if you have already figured out your sleep or do you take something to assist in your sleep? Because I really, I really can't sleep without it. <laughs> well, I love magnesium um, this glycinate also. Um, I like it for the aches and pains that come particularly at gardening time, which we are heavy into right now. Eight full hours on Sunday this week. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, I know. Um, so I love that. Um, Sometimes I can tell if it's not going to be a sleeping night. And so I might, um, I have something, uh, my daughter's a naturopath, so she's always coming home with stuff. 
um, is there's there's a, a brain thing in there. I'm pretty sure it probably has L-theanine in it. Um, but I'm fun, I'm one of those funny people like I can't take melatonin to sleep because it wakes me up. So I have to be really careful. But valerian's another one. If I take that, woo, wide awake. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, but magnesium is fabulous for helping you just calm down. And most women are deficient in it too. So it's not going to hurt anybody uh, to be taking that. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I like that combination. Because again, you know, coming back to the idea that mushrooms are food, those are nutrients. I was like, those are nutrients that are like meant to be in our bodies. And I feel I really like the idea of like, that's what I can rely on. Um, yes. I want to talk a little bit more about fatigue and get some tips and support because, you know, we are trying to handle so much. Maybe we're not sleeping so well, but we're also living still in the middle of a time that is so incredibly challenging psychologically um, for many of us. Like, what can we do to battle the fatigue? Like, what are some, some tips and some really like practical things that we can do? Well, you know, your advice about drinking water is amazing because uh, water is one of those things that if you don't have enough of it, nothing works. And if I'm feeling tired, I'll think, oh, when was the last time I had some water? So it's always my first, my go-to, right? Um, you know, clearly we want to make sure we're getting enough sleep. So we want to be turning off the electronics at night, sort of like when the sun goes down, honestly, that's when the TV should go off. That's when now longer days now in the summer, but put, put away the phone, turn off the TV, dim the lights, light candles, get outside because um, those lights that are shining in our eyeballs are going to be keeping us awake, right? And we want to, we want to mimic um, nighttime so that we can get to sleep definitely need to deal with stress, right? We want, because, you know, that not being able to get to sleep or waking up at three o'clock in the morning, that has to do with cortisol, you know, the stress hormone being too high. And then, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, it crashes and then your adrenaline shoots up because your body thinks you're going to die. <laughs> and then you're wide awake because the adrenaline is going, ah! So, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting your blood sugar even. You want to make sure that you try it. You do what you can to support um, your cholesterol. So, or sorry, your, um, your cortisol. So clearly stress is a problem. Stress happens. And, I, you know, we can't say, oh, just get rid of your stress. That is very naive and not very helpful at all. So we're all going to be dealing with stress. So what we want to be doing to simplify is make sure that we're giving our body what it needs in order to adapt to the stress. So whatever, you know, sometimes you need a little bit more of something. Sometimes you need a little bit less of something. So um, there are nutrients called adaptogens that help your body make that decision and support your body in doing it. And mushrooms come up again as a great way to do that. So um, reishi, for example, is really good as an adaptogen giving a little bit where it's supposed to, slowing things down when, when that needs to happen. Um, men need to work out to get their testosterone up and that helps to calm down cortisol. Women need to boost oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone and that helps to uh, suppress cortisol. So make sure you hug your loved ones, pet your dog, uh, give yourself a bubble bath, whatever it is that makes you feel loved and connected. You want to make sure that you're doing those things as well. And these are all simple, right? It's not, it's, um, you know, stress, stress is a reality just to help your body to deal with it in, in a very simple way. I love that. Um, so we, we met because you work with Optimi, which is like my new discovery and my new love. <laughs> it's all mushrooms. And so yes. because mushrooms are such a trend, I want to get you the expert. I want to get your advice because as soon as something is trendy and I've worked with like probiotics for like a decade, like actually a decade now, which is actually kind of weird to think now that I say about that. And so I yes. see so much misinformation about probiotics that people don't, they don't get it. They don't get that, you know, so much out there doesn't have research or that so much out there isn't manufactured properly. And you're literally paying like $50 for a bottle of nothing. Right. And so I feel like the same is going to be very quickly true of mushrooms as everyone gets into mushrooms. Everyone starts like seeing all these new mushroom supplements out there. Can you maybe help us avoid the marketing trend bunk and tell us like if we're interested in like taking something like reishi or taking something like lion's mane, 
Like how do we, we make sure that we're actually getting something that's real and that works? Right. right. Okay. Well, first of all, if we could step back, the reason that I like optimize because it's food. Mushroom is a food. Your body knows what to do with mushroom. You're not going to get, you know, 20 side effects, right? Uh, from taking mushrooms. So that for me is, is critical. Um, optimized mushrooms are organic, which is really important. Fruiting body. So what does that mean? Fruiting body is the part of the mushroom you can see. And there are a lot of supplements that are made with the mycelium. And mycelium is amazing. It connects everything. And when I say everything, I mean trees. If you've heard of that book, uh, how trees, something to do with trees talking to each other or something uh -huh. like that, that's all about the mycelium. But when you're talking about cultured mushrooms that are being used for supplements, they're grown on something called a substrate, right? They have to be grown on something. So if it's in the wild, you'll see mushrooms on trees, you'll see them on things that are decaying, you'll see them on grass, you'll see them on whatever it is, their food source. So mushrooms need something to grow on. And that substrate can be sawdust. It can be um, grains. Now that's not a problem for some people, but it is a problem for other people. You know, people who, who might have intolerances to grains, gluten or, or whatever, you know. And then if you can imagine these uh, mycelium are very, they're filaments, right? They're so delicate. They're like, they're like little angel hairs, right? It's like angel hair, it's beautiful, yeah. right? And I, like, trust me, I love mycelium. But I don't want sawdust in, in my supplement. And so when you've got this angel hair interspersed with some kind of a substrate, you're not going to get it all out. So, so I can imagine the challenge of getting impurities out of a supplement that is made purely with mycelium. So uh, Optimi is the fruiting body. That's the part of the mushroom that you can see. There's lots of research to support fruiting body. Um, and, it, and it goes back to this idea of whole food, right? It's, it's like the whole mushroom used in the supplement. So that's really critical. I love the fact that the company is Canadian. Um, it is actually in Vancouver, had offices in Vancouver. Yay, Vancouver! Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, we're going to be cultivating all of our mushrooms in Princeton, BC. So really, really, uh, that Canadian story is really critical as well, because when mushroom supplements are coming from other countries, you don't know that the standards are as high as they are when they're Canadian cultivated products as well. And how much should people take? Because the other thing that I find in wellness or health food is that, you know, like some food will be like, oh, it has this, it has this, but it has like 1% of you know that substance x which means it's not actually gonna do anything so like when it comes to mushrooms like how much is enough to make an impact on our body like how do we avoid paying for the marketing sprinkle or like like how do right. we know we're getting enough right well there isn't a lot of human studies on mushrooms there's a lot of traditional use right i'm sure that if people know what that means it means for thousands of years um practitioners uh, uh, have been using mushrooms in whole form, right? Here, have a tea of this and ha have this on your salad kind of thing. Not a lot of them are edible, but some of them are. Um, so um, so there is a challenge, but now, now researchers are starting to look at what is the actual dosage. Uh, it's certainly going to be more than a sprinkle, right? So um, anywhere from 500 milligrams, that's going to be a good dosage of, of, a, of a nutrient, depending on how often you're going to be taking it um, as well. And stay tuned because I'm sure we're going to see a lot more research on that specific question. And yeah. it's going to be different for each mushroom as well. It's important to remember that. Well, and that's really helpful and also really refreshing because I think so often when we speak, and this is something that I try and do when I communicate as well, it's like, I think a lot of people when they're like looking, oh, there's evidence, but you're like, yeah, but that evidence was in a lab. Like it's not, it's super interesting and it creates like the theoretical basis for things, but like we have to try it in a human until we know for sure. So I, I love how transparent you are about like, we still have a lot to learn, um, you know, scientifically. And I think, you know, very much respecting traditional knowledge and traditional usage of these things um, is so critical because it, also in like North America, we're like, well, this is this new thing. It's not new. 
no, 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 no. Like, no, it's not new. you know, like we, you know, there are people smarter than us who have been using this for like literally hundreds of years. And so we're simply catching up. Yes, we're simply catching up. And that's one of the things I like about Optimize. We're doing the research, but yeah. we, are, we are trying to determine the minimal dose required, not only of our functional mushrooms, but also um, the psilocybin mushrooms, which are the... Um, medical grade mushrooms that Health Canada has um, approved for use for people with serious mental health issues. Um, and we're doing that research and I find that really exciting as well. So interesting. Okay, um, we could honestly talk for like two hours, but I wanna, I wanna ask one question because I wanna give people like something really tangible to take home today, this minute, so that they can change their lives. Uh, and then of course we have our rapid fire questions as always on the All Sorts podcast. So the one thing that I wanna ask you to give people some tools is if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, I hear this, I feel overwhelmed, I feel scattered, I feel like my memory's on the fritz. Like what are three really useful things that they can do right now to start to change that? Okay, well, I think that, that um, you, looking at the social aspect, we need to become really mindful right? Uh, we really need to be aware of what is somebody else's and what is mine. And if I think it's mine, then that's where the work begins. Is it really mine or did I inherit this belief that I'm supposed to be X, Y, Z, right? So that's really, that kind of work is really important. Um, and we can often tell whether something's good for us by our first reaction to it. If someone asks us a question and suddenly you're like, whoa, right? The answer is probably no. Yeah. Do you have the courage to say no? That kind of thing. So becoming really mindful about what is good for you and what, what serves you. I think that that's um, really helpful. Uh, the other thing this, I thought of this while you were talking, and this is just a little secret. Everybody thinks they're supposed to be perfect, but nobody is. So just let it go. Yeah. You know, and think about if everybody's thinking I'm supposed to be perfect and I'm failing, then we should take that as permission to fail, right? Permission to let go of that responsibility of, of feeling that we need to be perfect. So that's important. And then finally, you know, we need, we need to support our bodies. We move through the world, making all of these choices, being in all of these social relationships in a body. And if our body isn't feeling good, then we're not going to make our best choices, right? We're just, we're gonna go with the flow or you know we're gonna sleep through it, one or the other. So it's really important that we take care of our body. And if one of your concerns is um, you know, you're, you're irritable, you have some anxiety, you're concerned about focus, concentration, memory, you're snapping at your kids and you don't wanna be snapping at your kids, try lion's mane. Optimize a lion's mane product is called Mindful, which I love. So it's a twofer, right? The mindfulness is really, uh, um, really, really important. So add something like that, simple ritual, leave it on the counter, drink your pitcher of water uh, and, and um, allow yourself to be imperfect. Oh my gosh, that's, it almost pains me to ask you the rapid fire questions because that is just such a beautiful place to leave off. <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyways, because tradition is tradition. So, uh, the first one is, what is one habit that you're still working on personally? I fell out of love with exercise also. And I have tried a thousand different things because I'm missing that body function piece where I ever get to a place of enjoying it. I used to love it. I'm struggling with that. So I, I bit the bullet and I bought this 10 minute a day workout. I don't know if you remember the show, the 20 minute workout, but this is a, oh my gosh, I did from, <laughs> from the eighties. Yes. I used to watch it and do that as a kid. <laughs> yes, I did too. So this is a 10 minute workout and I have done it every day that I've got it, which is, I think like four or five weeks now. So I'm feeling really good, but maybe I am finally an exerciser. That's incredible. I love it. Okay. If you don't feel like cooking, what do you make? Oh my gosh. I was going to say, I get my daughter to cook. <laughs> COVID brought everybody back home, right? Um, we have something that is going to sound really silly. It's called condo because I invented it when I lived in a condo with my daughter. 
And essentially it's pasta with tomato sauce um, and cheese. I love it. Like ground tomatoes, right? We yeah, yeah. Grind them out. Yeah, that's super simple. Amazing. And it can be that's, and, and I think that's always the thing. It's like, it can be that simple. And then you didn't just like call up A&W and like have a and I mean, sometimes I make that choice, but we've been really sick the past week. And I got to admit, I made the A&W choice. I mean, I love a Beyond Burger, but also <laughs> cheaper, faster than takeout and healthier. Right. Pasta right. is best. I love yes. it. Okay. Best thing you've read so far this year. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to think what's on my table right now. Um, oh, see, I don't have a list. <laughs> Let me see what I can see in the room here. Oh my gosh. You're going to edit this. <laughs> I will edit it. <laughs> and if you don't remember, which I kind of love because it's very much on brand for this podcast, yes, you can email me and I'll share it in the show notes. <laughs> okay. I think the book I'm reading right now is called Streams of Consciousness. Beautiful. Yes. I love it. Okay. Uh, lion's mane versus reishi. You have to choose. Lion's mane. Cool. And then you have 15 minutes all to yourself and you are actually not allowed to work or like housework. So what do you do? Uh, we have um, a pulse electromagnetic frequency mat in our house. And it's, it helps with grounding. So we got it in the winter when you can't go outside and stand on the dirt. Uh, and it emits frequency like the Schumann resonance, mm. right? 15 minutes on that. Typically I fall asleep, which is, there's no harm, no foul in that either, but it is beautiful. Okay. I have never heard of this before. And I feel like as soon as we hop off, I'm going to immediately go on the internet and become obsessed. We actually... I learned about the Schumann resonance for the first time on another episode of the podcast with Meg Lobus, who is a sound therapist. And we wow. talked a lot about frequency and sound and vibration and just, I'm a fan. So I immediately need to find out what this is. And we'll absolutely put that in the show notes too. Right. <laughs> Dr. Lisa Petty, you are a delight. Thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like it very much feels like therapeutic for me personally, having this conversation with you. Oh, so I, I, I just know that everyone listening is going to feel the same. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed chatting with you too. Finally. <laughs> I know. <laughs>